Nothing makes a summer birthday more magical than a vibrant bouquet from 1-800-Flowers.com. Just picture the look on your birthday girl's face when she sees her gorgeous bouquet being delivered. Whether she's at home, work, or school, no one can deliver a smile like 1-800-Flowers. And right now, when you order a dozen multicolored roses for only $29.99, 1-800-Flowers will give you another dozen, plus a vase, absolutely free. That's 50% off the original price. These gorgeous roses from 1-800-Flowers are picked at their peak and shipped overnight to ensure freshness and your friend or loved one's amazement. They make a great surprise for birthdays or even just because. A dozen multicolored roses, just $29.99, plus another dozen anavase for free. It's an amazing offer, but it does expire Friday. Every bouquet backed by 1-800-Flowers, 100% smile guarantee when it comes to planning the perfect birthday surprise. I don't settle for anything less than 1-800-Flowers.com. To order a dozen multicolored roses plus an extra bouquet anavase for just $29.99, Go to 1-800-Flowers.com, click the radio icon, enter the code Mike. That's 1-800-Flowers.com, the code is Mike. Nothing makes a summer birthday more magical than 1-800-Flowers.com. Right now, when you order a dozen multicolored roses for only $29.99, you'll get another dozen plus a vase absolutely free. Go to 1-800-Flowers.com, click the radio icon, and enter code Mike. Mike and Mike, back in Better Than Ever, we're presented by Progressive Insurance. Our guests like Andy North, two-time U.S. Open champ. He'll join us from Aaron Hills in his native Wisconsin. Coming up on the Shell Pennzoil Performance Line, just a couple of minutes. Brooks Kepka, a lot of uh, people remarked on his really low key celebration, mm-hmm. almost unenthusiastic response to winning yesterday and all of that. And then we just played you a bit of an interview with Matt Barry, in which he didn't seem all that um, overwhelmed by it. And he also didn't seem. He, he, ta- he told a story, for those of you not with us on the TV side here, told a story about how when he was playing on the European tour, like he just he felt tired of golf. It wasn't right. so yeah. much that he needed to come home. He wasn't homesick. He mm-hmm. just kind of got tired of the game. And if you read some quotes from him, which I will admit I hadn't read up until this, no. I, I, I was aware of Brooks Kepka, but I, I didn't know much about him. Um, baseball's in his family. His father, right. his grandfather was, uh, or a great uncle, I think, was Dick Grote, was a star player on the Pirates. And he comes from a baseball family. He liked baseball better than golf much of his life. He talks about how golf sometimes he finds to be boring. Here's the thing. We're very accustomed to our athletes loving the sport they play because most of them do. Right. To get to the very top, you almost have to. It is almost a prerequisite that you love it because the amount of time and energy and effort you have to put in, right. like take you, for example, you had to put so much work right. into becoming a pro football player that if you didn't love it, you probably would have said, this isn't worth it. But there are exceptions. There are sure. some people who are just so naturally gifted at something that they pursue it even if they don't really love it. And so what I feel like I'm getting out of Brooks Kepka when I was listening to that interview and some of the things I've heard him say is, Look, he's a brilliant golfer. Mm -hmm. He's one of the best in the world, obviously. He just won the U.S. Open. And I'm not suggesting he doesn't like it. But it doesn't feel to me like he loves it. Like some people love it. I mean, I don't – I love it in a wholly different way. I mean, I'm I'm terrible at it, comparatively speaking to him. But he just doesn't feel like a guy who loves it. And there are guys in football, Mike. You probably played with them. Yeah. They were there because they were incredibly good at it. They right, were making right. a good living and, doing and, it. And didn't love it. And we're making a great living. This guy, this is a guy who called golf at one point boring. Yeah. You know, so I, listen, I, I don't know where to go with that or what to do. You know, I mean, you know, he's going to. necessarily anything wrong You know, with he's going to. No, you know, he's going to stay in it. It's not like he's going to switch to baseball now. <laughs> right. You know, um, he's making a fortune. He just made just $2, million $2 million yesterday. Dollars. Yeah, $2 million. So you're right. Everybody, you, you can't go across the board and say everybody loves emphatically what they're doing. You know, they, 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 they're so good at it that it led to them being at it professionally, but it doesn't mean they're, they're infatuated by that sport. That holds true for almost every line sure. of work, right? There are lots and lots of people out there who do jobs they don't really yeah, enjoy. I'm, really, I'm good at this. It comes it's somewhat easy to me. I get paid a good amount for it, so I'm going to do it. Yeah, people who don't like what they do. Now, we're so unaccustomed to that with sports because they seem like so much fun yeah. that I do find myself I, I find myself watching this and listening to that conversation and thinking, if I could live my life over again and, and have been a, big, a professional golfer, like if, if I could have pursued that from a very young age, who knows if I would have had a, a talent for it? I'm probably not. Um, 
but I can't imagine a better life. Like, I can't imagine a better life than what those guys have because I love the game so much. And to be outside and traveling to these beautiful places all the time. And, right. Like, to me, it sounds like the greatest life in the world. But that's not necessarily a prerequisite to be great at it. And so maybe no. he's just not. It's not an indictment of someone, right? No, but maybe as it's long just... As long as they're giving a... you... Even in a team sport, if they're giving you everything they have, yeah. they don't necessarily have to love it. No, no, no. You don't have to... It's the the thing that i always say it's it's difficult to do it over a long period of time you know and, and not at least like the sport to not love the sport to put all the work in but some people i guess some people look at it just that it's work this is my job this is what i do i have to work in the off season to get ready for the games in the regular season i get paid a lot of money i'm going to do it as long as i can you know to to make money yeah certainly there is that you would like to think for the most part that that people Love because uh, those that don't play sports look at it as a sport, as an event you get to pay your money and go to or watch on TV, and it's a game. But for the athletes, it's their livelihood, it's their job, it's what we did to pay our bills and also try and make us. And we got paid a lot of money to do it, even when I played. I mean, comparative to the American, the, the average person out there, we made a lot of money. So, the, yeah, there are those that will do it just for the money of it. But I think it, it, it's got to be hard to do with all the prep work that you have to do uh, to get there. But it certainly can be done. All right. Let's bring Andy North into this conversation. Of course, does a terrific job with our analysis on, of golf on ESPN and is a two-time uh, U.S. Open champion himself. Andy, top of the morning. And how are you guys doing this morning? Oh, doing well. Doing great. Before we get into Kepka and any of the things that particularly that happened, uh, when you try, when you put a U.S. Open on a course that's only been in existence for 11 years, the course itself is going to become an enormous part of the conversation. Um, so I won't prejudice by giving it my thoughts. What were your thoughts on the golf course itself for a U.S. Open? Well, I think, uh, first of all, the people at Aaron Hills did an amazing job uh, preparing the golf course, preparing the whole site, the facility. Everything was really, the setup was was fantastic as far as hospitality and and all the things, the logistics of getting people in and out. That's never an easy thing to do, and the golf course was absolutely pristine. They literally haven't had rounds of golf on it by the public since last fall, so it was perfect. I walked around on Sunday, and there are about three divots that you could see, and those are from the guys that had played that day. Uh, so from that standpoint, it was unbelievable. Uh, going to a new venue is always difficult. It's difficult for the players. It's difficult for uh, the USGA because you really don't know what to expect. And and I think there was some of that this last week. I think a lot of players, you try to put a game plan together for what you think the winning score will be, and they had no idea uh, what that score might be. Um, you know, if you're if you're preparing for an even par type open, and you get 16 under. You know, you probably didn't play as aggressively as you probably should have. So there's all of that. Uh, and then the USJ, the setup. You know, there there was a lot of talk about, you know, was this a great Open? Was it not? Whatever. It just was a different type of U.S. Open. You know, I mean, in my opinion, the U.S. Opens that I loved were the Oakland Hills, the Oakmonts, the Wingfoot, the Oak Hills, traditional big old golf courses with narrow fairways and deep rough and hard greens and all that sort of thing. This was just different. Uh, it tested the players. Uh, we had a good week of weather, which was important, and that's one of the reasons the scores were so good. There were, there were 140 subpar rounds, most in any U.S. Open history. Seven players finished the tournament 10 or under. That scorer would have been good enough to win all but two of U.S. Opens in history. Will we see the Open played in a course like this again? I don't know. Um, I think it was a, a success from the USGA standpoint. Uh, could we go back there and maybe change the setup a little bit? Uh, maybe narrow the fairway some. Maybe have a little bit of rough around some of the greens. Uh, you know, you saw players miss greens, and, the, and getting the ball up and in was pretty simple. Uh, you don't see that normally at opens. So, uh, you know, I think there's a chance. But right now, the, the Open is signed up, I believe, for the next nine or ten years out. Um, and we're going to basically all historic golf courses uh, the next nine or ten years. You know, one thing that I think is so important about the Open, last year we went to Oak, Oakmont, and to go there and to be able to compare yourself against Palmer and Nicholas and, and some of the greats who have won 
the U.S. Open at that golf course. That part, the history is a big part of this championship. Right, Shinnecock next year and all the traditional venues. And that really goes back to the point from Saturday when Justin Thomas goes out there and shoots the round that he did. And you're trying to compare that to what Johnny Miller did. And I saw people that were sort of, you know, taking shots at Miller for not giving Thomas his due. And I'm not suggesting that Justin didn't play an unbelievable round of golf on Saturday. But when you look at the golf course that he played and you look at Johnny Miller doing it on a Sunday at Oakmont to win the U.S. Open, Andy, it really is very difficult to compare those two. Yeah, you can't compare that kind of stuff. Um, you know, the, the game has changed. They should they should be calling it a different name than what was played 30 or 40 years ago uh, with the equipment. And, you know, has the ball gotten out of control? Are guys hitting it too far? I mean, Brooks hit a, a three-wood off the 18th hole yesterday and hit 379 yards. Yeah. Well, there are no golf courses we can play that, if you hit it that far, are playable anymore. So... What are we going to do about it? You know, do you slow the ball down? Do you, you know, there's a lot of discussions about a lot of different things. But, uh, you know, at some point in time, we've got to do something. They don't let the major leaguers use aluminum bats, um, or, or you'd have to have 450 foot left field lines uh, to make the parks big enough. So, you know, I don't know. There's a lot of things that we have to talk about. Uh, the USGA needs to get their hands on, and, and they've just got to understand that these guys are hitting the ball so far that, I mean, when you when you play a 681 yard hole, and you hit a three wood, and and you're going at the green with a long iron, something's not right. That was unbelievable to me. I just was, you know, you you won two U.S. <laughs> Opens. If you were three, I saw Ricky Fowler hit an iron 300 yards yesterday. If you were 300 <laughs> yards away from a green in your day, what club would you have? What would you have turned to your caddy and said? I need a driver and a wedge, please. <laughs> <That's exactly right>. <laughs> <laughs> you know, can I tee this up? Yeah, yeah, it's it's changed, and we all understand that. And it's, is it good? Is it bad? That's for a lot of other people to decide. But I, I think that at some point in time we have to figure this out or there won't be any golf courses in this country we can play tournaments on. Is that one of the reasons we now have the seventh straight first-time major winner? And if so, what are some of the other reasons? I, I just think that it, you know, you go, we go through stretches like this every once in a while, and you know, if you look back, every one of these guys who have won are really good players. Um, you know, Dustin Johnson was like the next next best, the best player to have not won. Then it was Sergio, the best player who hadn't won. So I think it's just a matter of time. But if you look at maybe the the ten or so years prior, when he had Tiger winning you know, one or two a year, it's hard for guys to win. So, you know, you take Phil and Tiger out of the mix, that's 19 major championships that weren't playing in this tournament. That opens up the door for a lot of other players. Mike and Mike and Andy North, and the door was, of course, opened for Brooks Kepka, who was certainly not a household name, although he has been a good player for quite some time and, and has actually, I was just looking at his uh, results in the last eight majors, he's been very much in contention. He's finished fourth and fifth and tenth and eleventh, uh, excuse me, in the last eight majors. So he's been good. So this has been coming, Andy. Oh, absolutely. And I think, you know, if we look at what Brooks did last week, his performance might go down as one of the great greatest performances we've seen from a ball striking standpoint at a U.S. Open. I didn't get to see Hogan play the Opens he won or Bobby Jones, but he missed seven fairways last week. You know, there are tons of players in the tournament that played okay that missed seven in a day. He only missed seven fairways for the week and only missed ten greens for the entire week. That's ridiculous. Yeah. I mean, when Tiger won it at Pebble, I think he missed 20, 20 greens for the week, which is good at a U.S. Open. And this guy missed ten. That's incredible. Uh, you know, so his his ball striking was terrific. He went out there yesterday on a day with a little bit more wind. It, it died down a little bit as the day went on, but it was enough wind to cause some problems for the players and missed one green. That's how you go win U.S. Opens. What happened to Ricky Fowler in this? Started out strong, ends up tied for fifth. Now, you know, he, he hit he, his shooting 10 under, but you know a lot of the people thought he was going to get his first major here. What happened to his game through the weekend? Well, I think if you, if you look at how, particularly the last two days, Ricky's iron play wasn't as good. If you watched him on Thursday, his iron play was spectacular. He hit the ball right where he wanted it the whole time. 
he hit it below the hole. He had a ton of 10 and 12 foot putts for birdies. And if you if you look down the last couple of days, he ended up missing a ton of greens with irons. And he did an un, I thought he did a great job yesterday, just making a score. You saw him get it up and in from all over the place, you know, a half a dozen times just to keep himself in the tournament. Uh, so he just wasn't as sharp with his iron play. Mike and Mike and Andy North. And so where does it go from here now? We go through the rest of a golf season where, um, you know, we'll get Mickelson back, I would assume, for this. I don't expect that we'll get Tiger back. When we head to the British Open, who's the favorite? Are we looking at a guy like Kepka? Are we looking at Dustin Johnson once again? Does Ricky Fowler get back? Sergio, of course, is always a dangerous out there. Who do we look at right now as the top choices as we're a month away from the next major? Well, Birkdale is a, is a really good venue. It's it's a golf course that you you have to drive the ball fairly, you know, pretty darn straight on most of the holes. It's got a little bit of length. The wind's going to blow a little bit. I think you you get back to. It's pretty simple to say, geez, you know, you take the five, the best five or six or seven guys in the world, and they're your favorites. Well, obviously, they're they're the guys that technically are the best players. Um, I think Dustin Johnson's gone through a little bit of a, a, an area here for the last month or so that he has been as sharp as he's been. You know, we, we were so spoiled uh, with with Mr. Eldrick Woods that, you know, nobody can keep at that level. And you go back through the history of our game, guys go through, you know, one-year stretches or two-year stretches, or maybe if you're a great, great player, you can get through five or six years like Tom Watson did, that you're, you know, you're good all the time. You know, what Tiger and Jack did over 15 years is ridiculous that they didn't have bad weeks very often. And and their bad weeks were, you know, still finishing 25th in a tournament. So we've been so spoiled with people expecting that everybody's got to play perfect golf every time they go play. play. That's not how this game works. Um, you know, if you're a player that plays 20 times a year, 25 times a year, and you win one tournament a year, you're a great player, mm-hmm. you know. But we were so spoiled with a guy going out winning five, six, seven times a year. That's just that's crazy stuff. So, um, but you got to look at you know the, that the group of guys you you named. Um, I think Rory will you know get playing better, and 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 Jason Day has gone has scuffled a little bit this year at times. So I think all those guys are going better. But I think Burkdale's a golf course that. You know, a guy like Ricky, uh, uh, guys that drive the ball really well, uh, they'll they'll be guys that uh, will handle it well. And right now, you know, you'd surely think that Brooks Kepka's odds are going to be pretty darn good. He is Andy North. A terrific job, as always. Thank you so much, Andy. We'll talk to you in the next couple weeks. Gentlemen, thanks. Talk to you later. That's Andy North on the Shell Pennzoil Performance Line, taking synthetic motor oil performance to a whole new level. Make the switch to Pennzoil Synthetics today. He won the 1978 U.S. Open at Cherry Hills Country Club in Colorado. He won the 1985 U.S. Open at Oakland Hills in Bloomfield Hills, Michigan. I sit there and say, what happened to Ricky Fowler? Ricky still shot 10 under. I know. Still shot 10 under. You can't count that here. No, He was 7 under after the first day. Well, that's the thing. He did his damage on the first day when he was 7 under. Then then Saturday he had a decent day. Here's my takeaway from the tournament, okay, because the golf course becomes, when you're going to play it at a play, if you're not going to go to Oakmont or Shinnecock or Wingfoot or one of the, you know, the Pebble Beach, right? one of the places that everybody knows, Pebble Beach could have a week, well, that's a bad example, um, well, Oakmont is never going to have an easy week either, but I guess the point is those places can't be easy. There's no time that's going to be easy. They can play relative levels of hard, Everything fell they in, can't play everything easy. Everything fell in for this week to be easy. This place was I hate to say this. It's gorgeous. It looks gorgeous. I'm dying to go there. The spe- it's spectacular looking. But if you could hit the ball in the fairway, and, yeah. and, and as the point that Andy made was, um, Brooks Kepka hit 62 out of 72 greens in regulation. That's not supposed to happen at the U.S. Open. That's something that happens, yeah. you know, somewhere in March on the swing through Texas or whatever it is. Someone goes crazy and has a week like that, and they wind up shooting 16 under. The U.S. Open is something that is supposed to be won at two under par. Yeah. Three under Listen, par. Listen, I agree. It's supposed to be I brutally agree. hard. I agree. That's one of the reasons it didn't hold me as much because I do like to see the struggle. What held me was the competition, you know, until Kepka won 14, 15, 16, went birdie, birdie, birdie. And put it away because you're right. The fairways were wide. The greens, because of the rain, weren't the balls weren't flying off the green. They were sticking. Uh, so th- there was if you were putting it and and the guy hits it a ton. His average drive was 322 yards. Again, a 681 yard hole. They're 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 
knocking it on the green in the second shot. Uh, it's, it's ridiculous. He hit a three-wood. He hit a three-wood off a, off a tee box. He's standing on the tee. The little sign says 681 yards. He says, give me the three-wood. Now, granted, he's got a – I think at that point it was a three- or a four-shot lead. He does. So he wasn't, he wasn't going to take any chances. Plus, he also has a it. howitzer as well. He hit it farther. It was the yeah. longest drive of the day on the hole. He hit it with like a three-wood. Crazy. And, yeah. then, and then Ricky Fowler had 300 yards to the green and hit an iron. This is un- unimaginable. These guys are so good. That's another thing. These guys are so ridiculously good at this. I'm, I- how much does equipment come into play? A lot. No, no, no. I, 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 equipment come into play with, as I asked Andy, with the different winners in the majors, like the seven different, that, that their equipment is so good that for that weekend they can come out. The, the difference is that it used to be a test of the entirety of your game. Right. The U.S. Open is supposed to be the ultimate test of every aspect of the game of golf. Now, a handful of guys, whoever's on that week, is go- are going? They're all basically all of them are so long yeah. that now at this place they had a lot of par fives that you weren't reaching in too. These guys, you saw them laying up. Yeah. You know, a lot oh, yeah. of them having to hit those little chip shots and flap shots, and that's a big part of the game of golf that you don't see on a week in week out basis in the sport that much because all these guys are overpowering all the par fives. The par fives on the PGA Tour now are basically an opportunity for an eagle. Absolutely, um, th- that's what they amount to. But at the U.S. Open, and in fairness, they didn't this week. I don't want to be crit- sound like I'm criticizing Aaron Hills. I really liked it. I thought it was beautiful to watch. If that you you made exactly the right point, that if that final yesterday round was Jordan Spieth, Jason Day, and Ricky, be riveting, <laughs> riveting, instead of Kep- uh, Kepka and Harmon and Matsuyama making a late charge, right? Then I think it would have been riveting. Yeah, I think you would have been just fine with absolutely even at that score. Else. Even at that score, you, you would have been. Yeah, yes. I mean, I still prefer it harder, but I, I think you would have overlooked that quite easily. Every deck is made for standing on, but there's only one that's always had a way of standing out. So if you're looking to bring more style, comfort, and creativity to your life outdoors, call on the brand that's known for making the most in outdoor living. From decking, railing, and lighting to furniture, fencing, and framing. At Trex, we're engineering what's next in outdoor living. To learn more about all of the outdoor solutions Trex has to offer, call 1-800-289-TREX or visit trex.com. That's T-R-E-X dot com. Hey, everyone. Mike Golick here. Support for the Mike and Mike podcast comes from our friends at Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans. Chances are you're confident when it comes to your work, your hobbies, your life. Rocket Mortgage gives you that same level of confidence when it comes to buying a home or refinancing your existing home loan. Rocket Mortgage is simple, allowing you to fully understand all the details and be confident you're getting the right mortgage for you. To get started, go to rocketmortgage.com slash mics. Equal housing lender, licensed in all 50 states, NMLS, consumeraccess.org number 3030. Golik, a special guest, is in our studio. Yeah, the Aaron Fox is joining us right now. Uh, you, we were talking in the break a little bit, just going through the process that you're going through, uh, comparing it kind of the football combine to the basketball and the combine, what you go through. How, how, uh, how was the whole process for you as it's finally going to end on Thursday? Um, I've just been enjoying it. You know, it's, it's nothing that, that's been uh, too tough. A lot of the times just going through a basketball stuff and – and then a lot of the times just interviews with teams. So, I mean, basically interviewing for a job. What, one of the things we talk about in the NFL combine all the time is the crazy question sometimes that the, that people from the teams ask the players. Do you guys get that in the interviews? you got to get those, some crazy uh, questions? People do. People do. Then you kind of try to prepare for them, but you never know what people are going to throw at you. But I didn't. I, I actually didn't get those crazy questions. That's, I've been asked that. I'm like, nah, I just didn't get them. I've, I've heard some. I've heard some stories. I've heard, I've heard, uh, I heard Frank Mason's at the combine. And, I, uh, man, I wouldn't even have had an answer for that. Right. <laughs> but, but generally speaking, you've been cool with everything everyone's asked you, and it seems they've all seemed like normal things that someone might ask someone who wants to be a professional basketball yeah, player. Yeah, definitely. Nothing's been off the wall, at least yet. <laughs> Mike and Mike, the Aaron Fox is here. Your favorite player growing up was KG. Now, that's interesting to me considering I, mean, I guess you didn't know exactly how big you were going to be when you were a little kid, but, I mean, you know, he wound up being a seven-footer, and you're more of a wing. What was it about him that attracted you? Uh, just his personality, the way he played the game. Uh, actually, my trainer, one of his best friends, actually got drafted to the Timberwolves, and KG was there. So I've heard stories about how crazy he is. But, uh, I mean, I love that in a player, and that's just really what drew me to him. Is there 
Uh, amongst, as, again, as we were chatting before, I was going through my uh, time years and years and years and years ago. And, and as a 10th rounder, there's no real, boy, I'm mad at all the other nine rounds of players <laughs> that went in front of me, and I'm going to remember all their names. How about at the top? You're going to be at the top of the draft. Is there a competition amongst you guys about who's number one and where you get drafted, not only by overall but by position as well? Um, Not necessarily. You know, we can't really help where we're drafted. At the end of the day, we're going to play each other. Uh, we're, I mean, we're all friends at the top of the draft. Like, we've known each other for years, but we're going to see each other in the NBA. We're all competitive. We all want to play against each other anyways. So, um, I mean, I don't know if, if they're looking at it, but I don't really care where, where we all end up. Who have you known the longest? You say, and, and that's been the big difference when you got when guys play together or against each other in AAU and all that. How, who's the guy you've known the uh, longest? The guy in this draft that I've known the longest is Jason Tatum. We've known each other since the fourth grade, so... <laughs> We've we've gone back. Uh, our parents are are good friends. Mm. We know each other's parents very well. So, uh, Jason's probably the person I've known I've known the longest. <laughs> but as far as all the guys at the top of this draft, you know, we we were talking about this recently. Um, there was a, a thirty for thirty on ESPN about the Celtics and the Lakers in the eighties. How those guys hated each other. Yeah. And in this day and age, you just don't really have that. And one of the theories is it's because you guys all grow up together, even if you grew up in different parts of the country. So all these guys who were in your class, have you been playing against all of them since you were very, very young? Oh uh, yeah. So just about everybody that was one and done this year, I've played against almost my entire AAU career. You have some late bloomers, some guys come out late, but uh, for the most part, these guys have been at the top for. For six years. And including Lonzo. You've been playing against Lonzo Ball for that, because I've seen it. You've played against him for years. You've known him. You've known the dad. You've known the family. Oh, uh, well, I, actually, I only knew him. I, okay. didn't, I didn't even know he had brothers until uh, our senior year of high school. So, really? Yeah, that's... Because they, they, at what point did you become aware of that? Because they became sort of an inter- internet sensation, I think, uh, in part not even as much Lonzo, but LaMelo doing things, and then the dad. At what point did... Did you recognize the father was sort of becoming a major factor? In um, that was really just our senior year too. So uh, I kind of I knew him uh, junior year. They actually I, I want to say they won. They probably won state their junior year. But I remember they played against Malik, um, high school teams. So I knew I then I knew he had brothers, but you know I never knew his dad huh. until but, the until the following year. With what's been going on all as of late with it, do you think? People are rooting against Lonzo be- because of his dad at times, and is that fair? Uh, I mean, yeah, you have some people, but, you know, you can't really control it. It doesn't matter to me. I'm, I, I love Lonzo. It's, it's like a, another brother than me. Right. But like I said, on the court, we're all competitive. We all want to beat each other. But off the court, we're, we're all so cool. It doesn't. You know, we don't let what happens on the court affect us. De'Aaron Fox, who's going to hear his name called very early Thursday night in the NBA draft, is here with the Straight Talk, brought to you by Straight Talk Wireless, best phones, best networks, no contracts. The, the the commercial that you guys did for Foot Locker was one of the funniest things that we've seen in a long time. Mike brought it up the other day on the air. What did you know about it going into it? Because clearly you guys are all doing sort of a mock for those who haven't seen it. It was a Father's Day ad, and you guys are all talking beautifully about your dad. I think your line was, oh, he got up early and took me to all these tournaments all over the place. And then Lonzo goes into a, a series of really well-played jokes about his dad. What did you know going into it? I'm um, Going into it, I knew me, uh, I knew Jason, Jonathan, and I were going to talk about, you know, how our dads did this and that, you know, good things. And then all they told us was Lonzo was going to, you know, just go off a list of kind of what his dad's been doing. But... I didn't know how it was going to I didn't know how it was going to come out. But uh when I watched it the first time, I probably man, I probably watched it 50 times in a row. It was, it was hilarious, but you know, he I mean, he has a sense of humor, so I, I liked it. It's I good he it. uh, Yeah, yeah, he definitely th- that showed there and that, that was a great commercial. Yeah, I think that was something that people hadn't seen. Yeah, no, you know, we knew, but no doubt about it. So you you mentioned earlier about one and dones and certainly a number of them out there this year. John Calipari certainly had a share of them <laughs> of one and dones. And, and he embraces that. He understands that when he gets you guys to, to, to come to school. How does he and how well prepare you for that one-and-done situation of then getting to going to the NBA? Um, he definitely prepares us well. You know, we come in, uh, we're kind of just stoned in the fire. You know, uh, we'll have, like, the older guys, you know, teach us what to do first, you know, two weeks of the summer. Then after that, you just have to pick on – you have to pick up uh, extremely fast, especially at the point guard position. So I started every game. It was, it was pretty tough, but – you know, it's nothing that, you know, someone can't do. We've seen so many people go through it, and you know that you can do it, but you know it's a process. Along that line, so you finish you finish high school, and then so at what point, you just said just every game point guard, when, when is that job yours? So you come from high school, and here you are at Kentucky, and you're the man. You're the starter. Uh, crazy thing is I graduated three days before I had to be on campus. So I graduated. I didn't even much have a summer. As soon as I graduated, started packing, 
was on campus and it was time to go to work. I would say that's no summer. I wouldn't yeah, say no, not no. much of a summer. That's no summer. Well, then you get the little time uh, between summer school and the, uh, the fall semester. You get about three weeks, <laughs> barely. Yeah. But, um, I mean, I enjoyed it. You know, the summer, I'd rather not have a summer kind of because I wouldn't be doing anything. But uh, I really enjoyed my summer at Kentucky. De'Aaron Fox, I- I'm fascinated by – the way Calipari manages to get a, a bunch of players, and we've seen it with multiple groups, including yours. It's you, it's Malik Monk, it's Bam Adebayo. You, you're all – I guess it wasn't clear that he was going to go uh, one and done. He did wind up doing it. It wasn't clear all along. But you and Malik, you knew you were going to be there for one season. And he's done it with many other players, Carl Anthony Towns and others, where you come, everyone knows it's going to be one year, and yet you seem to buy into a team concept. You seem to buy into something larger than just maximizing your own draft stock. If you could put your finger on it, how does Calipari get you to do it? Oh, um, man, it's just his personality. You know, he's able to touch so many people in so, in, uh, so many different places. Uh, you know, he came into my house. He just has so much swag. Um, you know, he doesn't come in nervous. He doesn't talk about anybody but, you know, Kentucky. He doesn't even much talk about himself. He doesn't really talk about all the guys that went to the NBA from his school. Uh, it's just, you know, that track record. So, you know, him coming in with that swag, it's just, I don't have to talk about that. You know about that already. So I'm going to tell you what I think you can do and what, you know, he doesn't really, he doesn't promise us anything. He never told me I was going to start. He never told me how many minutes I was going to play. And that was just something that really drew me to him. At what point, is it in high school? Are you in high school when you, when you realize or, or know or at least have the idea that wherever you go to college, you're a one and done? Um, you know, you really start seeing people do mock drafts so early. You know, you're probably a sophomore, junior in high school. So uh, you start seeing things and you really start listening and paying attention. And it's like, you know, it doesn't really matter where I go if I go and perform for a year then I can go to the NBA, I can get drafted and live out my dreams. And that's, that's how it was for us. De'Aaron Fox, you played in two, I'm sorry, Mike, you played in two of the most memorable games of this year's NCAA tournament, one of them on a Friday night against Lonzo Ball. And I know that you say you and Lonzo are very good friends and all of that, but that was an important game for a lot of reasons. I'm sure a lot of draft, you know, a lot of scouts are sitting there watching you two guys going head-to-head. What was your mentality going into that night? Because you really you dominated that matchup. Uh, playing against any 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 uh, any player, any guard like that, um, you know, it's supposed to be top two pick in the draft. You know, just you should you should be up for that. You know, you people give you people gave us our, their best every single game, and um, you know, just knowing that that was an extremely important game. You know, I just wish we could have got to the final four, won a national championship. You know, my our all of our stocks on the team will probably be even higher. But um, I knew going into that game that I, I would have had to have a good game and. I mean, I went out and <laughs> I had a great game. Yeah. <laughs> and then you did. You were tremendous. And then the Carolina game two days later, which I know ended in heartbreak for you and your teammates on the last second shot that they make. And then your reaction was so um, – your emotional reaction afterwards was, was so noticeable. I think people were really moved by that. How, how would you describe now, looking back on it, what your feelings were when that game and that season and, and your time at Kentucky ended? Um, I mean, I'm fine with – I'm fine with, uh, with how my reaction was. I wish, you know, we didn't lose that way. But um, – you know, you can't really change anything. Things happen for a reason. I'm kind of happy they won the national championship because we, like, at least y'all didn't beat us and then go lose. Right. So, uh, <laughs> and then I'm happy for my, my boy Justin Jackson. Uh, I've known him. You know, he's from Houston. So, um, just the way, I mean, I think we had a great season. You know, we went on a three-game losing streak, and after that, I think we won, like, 15 in a row. So, um, especially with that young group, we were, like, the youngest team in the tournament. And uh, we, we were able to go that far and lose to the most veteran team, the team that went to the national championship two years in a row. So I feel like we had a pretty successful season. So now you, you get ready, you get drafted on Thursday, go to a team, whatever team it's going to be. You, you obviously watch the NBA, know the NBA. Is any doubt in your mind you can, you can, just like you started day one in Kentucky, you can go in and get handed the ball for some NBA team and fit right in? I have no doubt in my mind that I can do it. And um, the only thing is now, you know, you're playing against grown men. It's going to be a lot different. Uh, I felt like for me, at least, you know, most of our, the freshmen on our team, the jump from high school to college wasn't, wasn't very big. But I know from, the, uh, from college to the NBA is going to be a lot larger. But like I said, I, you've seen guys do it all the time. You've seen, you know, 19, 20-year-old rookies go in and actually, actually perform and, and do well. So um, I know it's something that I can do, but I know it's going to be extremely challenging. But, hey, you know, that's what I love about the sport. Sorry, have, have you been given a sense of what to expect of have you and the people that, that represent you have a sense of what will happen Thursday night? Um, just a little, but you never really know what's going to happen on draft night. You know, crazy things happen. So uh, we're just going in with open-minded and, you know, wherever the chips lay, you know, that's, that's where you're going to go. You think you're the best player in the draft? I, I do think I'm the best player in the draft. 
I mean, you know, every player, even if you're in the back, back, uh, the back end of the second round, I feel like if you don't think you're the best player, if you don't have that confidence in yourself to go into the NBA, then, you know, it's going to eat you alive. Well, listen, we wish you nothing Absolutely. but the best of luck. It was a terrific season to watch you at Kentucky, and we're looking forward to seeing the next level for you. Good luck on Thursday night. It's the culmination of a lot of work, and you deserve it. Well done. Oh, yes, sir. Thank you. Oh, by the way, so you got a good suit already and all that? Now? Oh, yeah. I have my, I've had my suit picked out for about two weeks. I'm not going to give you any hints. You'll see it. You'll see it Thursday night. Okay. <laughs> so as we found out, style very important in the NBA. Well, oh what my suit gosh. did you wear to the draft that you got picked? Are you kidding me? You mean in my dorm room as I waited for the tenth round? <laughs> I started out in jeans, ended up in shorts and a tank top. <laughs> <laughs> Congratulations, Aaron. Thank you, Thank you very much for coming. Thank you. Great Thank you for having me on. Repeating for the um, rest of the country as it joins us now. I think everyone was really blown away by De'Aaron Fox. Great personality. Yeah, yes. really. He's got star. He's got a certain star quality. There are certain qualities that people have that you cannot really define. Right. I can't. I can't sit here and put into words what it is about him that just feels like he's going to be a star. But he does. I, I. I know you sense it too. Oh, absolutely. There's just sort of an indefinable quality about the personality, and you have to have the game that goes with it. Sure do. He certainly does. He needs to fill out because he's. You know, he's. He's thin, skinny as I am. Thin, yes. But that kid takes it to the basket like crazy. And one of the things is you get such a small, limited sample. With these guys, they play one year of college and that's it. But if you, if you said to me right now, absent need or anything else, but the way the game of basketball is played today and everything else, which of the kids in this draft do I think is going to be the best NBA player? I think I'd put him second. I think I would put uh, Josh Jackson out see, of Kansas first. What, what, what's not fair, why I can't answer, I didn't see enough of Markel Fultz. No, I didn't I, see I just any didn't. of Markel I, I just Fultz. didn't. So... And and he's going number one. So I mean, and a team traded with another team that was going to take him number one. So, right. but which also means that a team traded out of number one rather than you're exactly have right. A, a free you're exactly shot right. At so I, it's tough for me to say because I didn't see enough of him play. So it'd be very unfair for me to say this guy's going to be the best one. I haven't seen who were the top pick of the draft. Never got picked at. Uh, I didn't see him play much at all, and they didn't make the NCAA tournament either, which is is very odd that Philadelphia is going to have two guys in two years as being the number one pick that couldn't lead their team to the NCAA tournament. Here's another thing that I find just uh, amazing because I always compare the football and the basketball when you go to college. Here's a guy who graduated in uh, De'Aaron Fox. Three days later was on the campus of Kentucky, and a few weeks later was basically the starting point guard for that team. Yeah. You know, as, as an 18-year-old freshman, I mean, rarely do you walk into college football, even in that case. You walk in in the first summer workouts, and then you're the starter go before you even get to, 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 to camp. It, it, it's just – and you're running the team. You're, it, it's just That's what amazing. college basketball and, is and, now, and they And they oh, – not only – and oh, by the way, and you're great. Yeah. And you excel at it to the point where you're going to be one of the top picks in the NBA draft. It's incredible the acceleration where they go from high school – to college and and but how well some of these one year guys perform because anyone who's markedly older than them isn't as good as them yeah that, that that's what college basketball is now generally um, players on that level don't stay in college nope. that long so they're playing against other guys their age and guys who are two or three years older than them but not as good as them right so they're ready to step right in there and play on that level but they're not ready to step in and play in the NBA level which is why I'll say again and I think De'Aaron Fox maybe Markel Fultz maybe Jason Tatum maybe Josh Jackson maybe Malik Monk maybe the list there's going to be a couple of players in this draft who are going to wind up being stars yes. on the pro level yeah but none of them is going to be a player that is the reason a team wins a championship in the next three years right I mean if so it'll be the first time ever probably probably not I I, I the it's one, never happened. No, no, you're right. right? I mean, Leading LeBron James, team. Kevin Durant. Right, now, right. You know, you put you put one of these guys on Boston. That's what I mean. One of these guys is going to be on Boston. Right. That's what we're that. So that there's your Unless difference. Boston trades that. Right, team. right, right. If, if Boston picks at number three, you are putting one of these guys on Boston and not asking them to be the star right away. So that's the biggest difference is the fact that Boston had the number one and now the number three pick, and they were the number one seed in the conference. And then the way the thing breaks down, it's also confusing because by the time a player really reaches his very best, when you really find out what he can be, he's on to that second contract, and now you're already starting the clock ticking right. on, you know, is he going to be super max? Is he going to leave already? That's, that's sort of where oh, they yeah. stand.
Nothing makes a summer birthday more magical than a vibrant bouquet from 1-800-Flowers.com. Just picture the look on your birthday girl's face when she sees her gorgeous bouquet being delivered. Whether she's at home, work, or school, no one can deliver a smile like 1-800-Flowers. And right now, when you order a dozen multicolored roses for only $29.99, 1-800-Flowers will give you another dozen, plus a vase, absolutely free. That's 50% off the original price. These gorgeous roses from 1-800-Flowers are picked at their peak and shipped overnight to ensure freshness and your friend or loved one's amazement. They make a great surprise for birthdays or even just because. A dozen multicolored roses, just $29.99, plus another dozen anavase for free. It's an amazing offer, but it does expire Friday. Every bouquet backed by 1-800-Flowers, 100% smile guarantee when it comes to planning the perfect birthday surprise. I don't settle for anything less than 1-800-Flowers.com. To order a dozen multicolored roses plus an extra bouquet and a vase for just $29.99, go to 1-800-Flowers.com, click the radio icon, enter the code Mike. That's 1-800-Flowers.com, the code is Mike. Trex composite decking is rod and splinter resistant. Wood is not. Trex is insect proof. Wood is not. Trex eliminates time-consuming maintenance. Wood does not. Trex comes with a 25-year fade and stain warranty. Wood does not. So here's the question. Why would you ever choose to build with wood? Make sure your next deck is built with Trex. With all the huge news going on, we got the number one pick in the NBA draft traded. We got Paul George telling the Pacers, trade me or you're going to lose me for nothing. We have the U.S. Open over the weekend. We have huge boxing news, and we're going to have the legendary promoter Bob Arum live in just a minute on the Shell Pennzoil performance line. But with us here on Mike and Mike, presented by Progressive Insurance, the thing that got the most reaction was when we told you that 7% of the population, which is 16 million people, which is about the population of the state of Pennsylvania, legitimately believes the chocolate milk comes from brown cows. That's stunning, but I guess it shouldn't be because there are there are things out there that we we all don't know, like some of the other questions that I survey. I, I I wouldn't have known in high school. I don't believe that pickles came from cucumbers. You didn't know where watermelons grew. Do you know what raisins are? Grapes. Right. Yeah. Uh, do you think everyone knows that? Like no. I remember a time not. in my life when I didn't know that. Yeah. Now I yeah. think I was seven. Yeah. But I mean, I, you know, pickles and cucumbers. I think I always knew because they look alike. And right. If you come from where I come from in the world, pickles are a very big part of your life. Right. So um, I think I always knew that one. Like it says here, for example, here's one. Uh, More than half of people in high school didn't know pickles were cucumbers or that onions and lettuce were plants. Plants. So an onion is a plant. What does that mean exactly? I I don't know. I mean, it doesn't grow on a tree or it doesn't grow on the ground. So it grows in a what? In a pot? Well, no. uh, Your Aunt Millie is growing some onions? uh, (laughs) Aunt Millie, you want to pick a couple of onions from the pot in your living room there? Plants go in the ground and an onion is a plant. Yeah, so that's what I mean. If it's not growing underground like a potato, like a root, or not growing in a tree like an apple or an orange, then it's a plant. If it's growing, I guess. Like on a vine? That's what I'm I'm guessing. These are the kinds of things that that, that take the show in in directions it was really never meant to go. saying it with any kind of assuredness, that's for sure. Okay, so we got all that very quickly, and then we'll get Bob Arum into the conversation here in two minutes. Um, Paul George tells the Pacers, trade me or you're going to lose me. If you're the Lakers... Because every, every, all the conventional wisdom, and obviously there have been conversations amongst people mm-hmm. that we're not aware of, meaning between Magic and his people and, and Paul George and his people. And for all we know, maybe even directly between Magic and Paul George. But if you're the Lakers, do you move assets right now to get him? Or are you willing to roll the dice that he winds up getting traded somewhere else for a year and decides wherever it is he likes it there? I don't. Uh, I understand don't what I, I, I don't move assets. Okay. I wait the year. I, I think because, like we said, we, we've all know this about Paul George. So the Lakers do. And, and I don't know what if or what conversations that they have had. But in this day and age, you can you I would think you would have some conversations that they are going to feel, I, it, even though it definitely is still a roll of the dice, is the fact that, hey, you know, Paul, the best way to come to a better team is us not having to give up assets for you right now. So we're going we're gonna to do what we do with our picks, maybe get another one, try and have a good young team for you to come to, and then see what maybe other free agents we can get as well and build something out here. 
So I believe that's the way it will go. So I don't think they're going to trade for him. I think Paul George will get traded. To me, the biggest question is, if you're the Cleveland Cavaliers, how much do you give up? If you, you can sit there and say all you want, we can try and entice him to sign a long-term deal. But you have to go into it with your eyes open saying there's a good possibility you won't. And that whatever trade you make, that you have to understand this could be a trade for a one-year rental. And are you willing to do that for a championship? Certainly depends on the player. To me, it would not be Kyrie. I would not trade him. Kevin Love, I, I, I certainly would think long and hard about it. Yes, to do that, to try and, and, and get this one year, whatever ancillary parts that didn't work for Cleveland this year. You didn't have the guys, some of the guys coming through like you wanted to. Tristan Thompson, two years ago, had a monster series against Golden State. With the makeup of Golden State's team now, he did not this year uh, in, in many of the games. So, there are, there are pieces of the, uh, of the puzzle that you'd let go to bring in Paul George to make that run because you're on the year-to-year with, with uh, LeBron James. All right, there's a lot more in that to get to, and we will as the hour continues. But we have a legend standing by ready to go in Los Angeles this morning, and we're thrilled to bring him into the conversation. You may have seen the announcement yesterday that we have a huge fight coming yes. to regular television. Not pay-per-view, yes. Here on ESPN from Brisbane, Australia. July 1st, 9 o'clock Eastern on ESPN, Manny Pacquiao will fight Jeff Horn um, in what may signal a little bit of a shift in the direction that big-time boxing is going. And if you are our age, then there is no bigger name in boxing promotion Mm -hmm. than the name Bob Arum, who is standing by and joins us live this morning from the Shell Pennzoil Performance Line. Uh, Bob Arum, Mike and Mike here. Good morning, and thank you so much for taking the time. How are you this morning? Good morning. It's a pleasure to be with you guys. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you. Let, let's start with this fight in particular and then get to what it may mean. What can the public expect to see from Pacquiao? Last time we saw him, he was fighting Mayweather. Obviously, he talked afterwards about having a shoulder. He's now ready to return. What should the public be expecting to see from Pacquiao in his return? Well, Pacquiao actually has fought twice right. since the Mayweather fight. Uh, unfortunately, it, both fights were on pay-per-view, and therefore the audience was relatively limited. But this time, we're going to see Manny Pacquiao, the first time he's been on free, over-the-air television. Uh, a great gift from ESPN and Manny Pacquiao. You don't have to dig into your pocket. It's a great, great start of the July 4th weekend. And, and we have learned to live with pay-per-view, knowing it has been there for a while now. What does this mean for boxing? What can this do for boxing to have so many more sets of eyes on it? Well, I think it's very important for boxing to have the biggest possible audience. I mean, look at uh, professional football, uh, particularly the Super Bowl or the playoffs. Massive audiences. Why? One of the reasons is... People don't have to pay extra to watch it. Now, in boxing, uh, the, the big fights have always been or recently been on premium television. And then the bigger fights are on pay-per-view and people have to go into their pocket to watch it. Now, uh, thanks to ESPN and Manny Pacquiao, we're going to be able to see a Manny Pacquiao championship fight against a really tough Australian kid for free. And we're going to get a massive audience. That's coming up again Friday, July 1st. I'm curious to get your overall take, because Mike and I have talked about this a lot. We're both old enough to remember when you were promoting Muhammad Ali, and these fights were available, generally speaking, on free television all the time, and they they came fast and furious and somewhat regularly, and boxing occupied a place that it, it does not candidly now, and I believe that this is one of the big reasons why. In your view, what has the pay-per-view phenom- phenomenon meant to the sport of boxing? Well, you know, it's put a, money in a lot of people's pockets, including mine, uh, which has been good. But on the other hand, uh, it has uh, limited uh, the visibility of the sport. Uh, you're quite correct. In 1978, uh, the first Ali Spinks fight was on CBS, and the second Ali Spinks fight from New Orleans was on ABC, and it was for many years the most watched program uh, uh, 
uh, in history. Uh, and uh, uh, therefore, boxing had a huge, huge following. Once boxing went to premium television, HBO and Showtime, the audience was limited because the platform of HBO or Showtime is relatively limited as against free-to-air television. Uh, and then to compound it, uh, uh, the big fights were all on pay-per-view. Now, there is a, a, a role for pay-per-view fights, but you can't keep jamming these fights into the public and having them pay big money month after month, because if you do, the sport is going to die. And thanks to ESPN, uh, we're going to bring back the sport of boxing. Once people can see Manny Pacquiao with Jeff Horn, for example, on that card we have this great Irish kid, Mick Conlon, who people will be seeing on that telecast. Once they see these fighters... Uh, in massive numbers, uh, they're going to be hooked again to the sport of boxing. So, I, so just so I can understand what you're saying, and it seems like the free boxing or the free TV boxing to get the a, a massive amount of eyes to see it, but still the bigger fights, the biggest fights, you you, you don't think you're not going to get rid of pay per view. Those are still going to be on pay per view, correct? Yes, of course. I mean, uh, but but it's got to be limited, and it's got to be fights that are special, and fights that people look at as being very competitive. Those fights will remain on pay per view, but not in the quantity that we have today. Mike and Mike, the legendary Bob Arum is with us. Before we get specifically into the one fight that people will talk the most about, whether they should be or they shouldn't be. What is your overall feeling on what it would do for boxing if there was some sort of centralized commission? We've heard different people um, in the government over the course of years in Congress talk about the possibility of that. The other sports have a centralized commission that creates a circumstance where everyone might be able to prosper as opposed to one where there's a lot of power in a very small number of people and then only a few people, as you point out, wind up making huge amounts of money. What, what would your view be on what it would do for the sport if there were some sort of centralized commission? Well, you realize uh, the league situation uh, which has a centralized uh, commissioner like football or basketball is different because they're franchises and uh, they have an incentive to join together for the good of all of them. Boxing is different. There is no real uh, bar to entry. Anybody with a bank account can become a promoter. Uh, I don't think it would help necessarily if we had a federal commission. I'm a states' rights guy. I believe that states can, uh, and many do, uh, regulate boxing well. I mean, California, Nevada, New York uh, have good commissions. Uh, so I think the answer really is let it flow but let's get these fights before the biggest possible audiences. And once we do, people will begin to pay more attention to the sport. The sport will grow. Uh, because remember, it's a sport that can appeal and does appeal to everyone. It's a global sport. People around the world participate in boxing whether it's in China or Australia or England, uh, there are bo China, there are people from all countries uh, who have uh, boxers. And the rules are relatively simple and people can follow them. We just need the exposure. And thanks to ESPN and what they're doing in this fight, Manny Pacquiao, world title fight against Jeff Horn, uh, I think we're on the way to getting just that done. And again, that's July 1st, 9 Eastern. So then about seven weeks after that comes the, the, the McGregor-Mayweather fight. And so just right off the bat, when you first heard that that was going to happen, that it got done, that it got a date, that it was official, 
What were your initial thoughts? Well, I don't like to, to really criticize the fight that any other promoter puts on. I mean, I have a real difficulty looking at it as a competitive matchup, given the fact that McGregor has never participated in a boxing match. But then again, nobody is putting a gun to anybody's head. You either believe it's non-competitive and therefore pass on it, or you want to see it uh, and you pay your money. So, I mean, the marketplace will dictate whether that fight uh, does well or doesn't do well. I'm inclined to believe that it will do well because people will be curious. But as far as I'm concerned, I don't look at it really as a competitive matchup. There are some who worry that it is taking, that it is getting so much attention and that people will shell out their money for that, that it might take attention and money away from other much more legitimate uh, boxing matches that are out there. Is that a concern you have? No, I don't think so. I I mean, people aren't stupid. Uh, I I mean, (laughs) I mean, the people who want to watch boxing, uh, you know, there are some great fighters out there. Uh, Terence Crawford, uh, this Vasil Lomachenko, who may be the best fighter since Muhammad Ali. All of these fighters will find audiences, uh, and all they need is exposure. Manny Pacquiao and Jeff Horn, because it's being shown on ESPN and nobody has to go into their pocket, will have a appreciably bigger audience watching it than Mayweather McGregor, where you have to pay maybe 90 or 100 bucks to watch it. And, and you're right about the uh, Mayweather McGregor. People are going to either tune in because of the possible show and, and, and some think McGregor has a shot. Both of us here don't think he has a shot at all. So from a competitive standpoint, maybe not so much. But then it's about the promoting of it and the show. Let's go back to 1976 when you from boxing and Vince McMahon from wrestling had you promoted this. Muhammad Ali and Antonio Inoki, the, the professional wrestler, they had a bout together. So take us through that and the seriousness and or entertainment value and promotional value of that. I mean, what? Ali Anoki, which you're right, I promoted, was one of the uh, worst things that I've done in my my pro- professional promotional career. Uh, Herbert Muhammad, the manager of Ali, asked me to promote that fight. Japanese people, uh, Anoki was a wrestler who uh, performed in Japan, had come up with a lot of money. Uh, I had uh, signed Ali to fight Ken Norton later in the year in September in Yankee Stadium. And so I went along with Herbert and agreed to promote that fight. And then I realized, what the hell was I promoting? (laughs) I mean, how can you promote a boxer against a wrestler? How are you going to do it? So I went to my friend Vince McMahon uh, and I said, Vince, how am I going to do this? And Vince, of course, being a great wrestling promoter, said, here's what you're going to do. You tell Ali to fool around for a few rounds, and then finally he gets Anoki up against the ropes and looks like he's throwing real vicious punches at Anoki. Now, Anoki, who was a great professional wrestler, used to keep a razor, a little razor, in his mouth so he could actually cut himself and blood could come down. That was one of the great things that he was known for. So Anoki would cut himself, the blood would come down, and Ali, the humanitarian, would turn to the referee, please stop the fight, please stop the fight. The referee wouldn't. Finally, Ali would turn his whole body around to the referee and say, you got to stop the fight. Anoki would jump on his back, and the referee would count one, two, three. Anoki would win the fight, and Ali would claim it was another Pearl Arbor. That was the script. Now, when Ali gets to Japan, uh, he goes and sees my PR guy, 
And he says, when do we start practicing? And there was a fellow who worked for the Japanese, who was a union guy from the United States, and he was the only person in the world that thought this was legitimate. And he says, what practice? And that spooked Ali. So I had to fly over to Japan and sit with Angelo, Ferdy Pacheco, myself, day after day with the Japanese trying to get rules for this fiasco. <laughs> we never could get the rules. They threatened that they would break Ali's leg so he couldn't go into the Norton fight. And anyway, the we had no rules going into the fight. The fight was in the morning for uh, closed circuit at prime time in the United States. Vince, meanwhile, was doing undercard fights in Shea Stadium, Andre the Giant against Chuck Webner, uh, Vern Gagne in Chicago, all over the country, a wrestler and a boxer. But those were staged, so they worked like a charm. Ali Anoki had no script. So now the bell rings, and the first thing Anoki does was go on his behind and kick out his feet. And Ali is running around, and by the third round, he's yelling, you yellow, get up and fight. And, of course, Anoki didn't know about fighting. He was an actor. and But he had on his feet, he had on his, the shoes, he had spikes. And when he kicked out his legs, he would cut Ali's legs until Angelo Dundee saw what was happening, made him change his shoes. But anyway, Ali's legs were infected from the fight. And at one point in the fight, Anoki did stand up, and Ali threw a punch and missed Anoki by a foot. But Anoki, being the great wrestling actor that he was, staggered back like it was the punch that had landed on Sonny Liston. But we went through 15 rounds of this nonsense, and finally the referee called it a draw. But meanwhile, meanwhile Ali's leg becomes infected, and we almost lost the fight with Ken Norton almost lost in the sense of it not happening that September. So that was my one experience with this kind of nonsense. Now, I'm not saying that McGregor and uh, Mayweather will be like that, but after all, look at McGregor's record as a boxer, zero and zero. This is this, you say, well, he's the best MMA guy. So what? He's not the, he's fighting against a world-class boxer. It would be the same if you took a great athlete like LeBron James and you put him in with this Joshua kid. I mean, he'd get destroyed as great an athlete as James is. I can tell you one more story that's yeah. sort of interesting. Years ago, I was promoting Ali in England. He was fighting Brian London. And the great football player, Jim Brown, who was the one who introduced me to Ali, uh, and was in London making the movie Dirty Dozen. And Jim had had uh, made up his mind that he was not going to play football anymore. Nobody knew this. But Jim came over to the hotel I was staying, and he said, Bob, do me a favor. Go speak to Ali. Uh, we could, I could fight Ali in the ring, and it would make a ton of money. Now, Jim Brown was the greatest athlete that I had, had seen to that point. Jim Brown got into fights with everybody in football, whether they were linemen or running backs like Cookie Gilchrist, but he would beat the hell out of any football player that he had an argument with. And he had participated in amateur boxing uh, when he was a young man uh, in college. And he was obviously in college a great lacrosse player, great uh, baseball player, and the, the greatest football player. So he was the top, top guy. 
So I thought, hey, this is pretty reasonable. So I went to Ali and I presented it to Ali. And Ali said, Bob, bring Jim to Hyde Park where I'm, I run in the morning and let me talk to Jim and see if he's really serious. So I brought Jim out to Hyde Park and Ali says to Brown, Jim, throw punches at me, hit me as hard as you want, really throw these haymakers to knock me out. And Brown says, you're crazy. He says, no, Jim, throw those punches. Brown threw punches for at least a minute, couldn't hit him on the behind. I mean, couldn't land a punch <laughs> on Ali. And Ali took his two hands, I'll never forget it, and slapped Brown about 60 times in the face. And he says, Jim, do you really want to fight me? And Brown said, no, nah, better off stick to acting. Oh, that is and a, walked uh, away. What a That's story. story. That we could do this forever. The fight, again, Manny Pacquiao, Jeff Horn from Australia, July 1st, 9 Eastern on ESPN. Let's do this again. Bob Arum, thank Thanks, you Bob. so much for the time uh, and the stories my, today. My my pleasure being on. Good luck, guys. What a joy. Thank you so much. That's unbelievable stuff. Bob Arum with us. Every deck is made for standing on, but there's only one that's always had a way of standing out. So if you're looking to bring more style, comfort, and creativity to your life outdoors, call on the brand that's known for making the most in outdoor living. From decking, railing, and lighting to furniture, fencing, and framing, at Trex, we're engineering what's next in outdoor living. To learn more about all of the outdoor solutions Trex has to offer, call 1-800-289-TREX or visit trex.com. That's T-R-E-X dot com. Hey, everyone, Mike Golick here. Support for Mike and Mike podcast comes from our friends at Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans. Chances are you're confident when it comes to your work, your hobbies, your life. Rocket Mortgage gives you that same level of confidence when it comes to buying a home or refinancing your existing home loan. With Rocket Mortgage, you can apply simply and understand fully so you can mortgage confidently. To get started, go to rocketmortgage.com slash mics. Equal housing lender, licensed in all 50 states, nmlsconsumeraccess.org number 3030. All right, uh, Mike and Mike, and thrilled to have you with us today. You know, sports means a lot to all of us, right? We make our lives in it in a variety of different ways, but there are some times that sports means a great deal more than almost any other times. You may not be aware, but you should be, of the Warrior Games. The Department of the Navy, in partnership with the City of Chicago, will host the annual Department of Defense Warrior Games from June 30th through July 8th this year. They'll be uh, taking place in part in Soldier Field and joining us now to talk about that. We are thrilled to have John Stewart, one of the funny and best people in show business, and we're honored to have Air Force, uh, Air Force Master Sergeant Brian Williams, who's here, who will be participating in wheelchair basketball, seated volleyball, and cycling. Gentlemen, it's great to have you both. Well, thanks for having me. Really great to have you. John, how, how did you get involved? This is fan Warrior Games are fantastic. Phenomenal. Yeah, talk about you getting involved in this. Uh, well, last year, uh, a, a friend of mine who had... Uh, uh, who had worked with the games uh, through this organization that he runs called uh, uh, ACP uh, asked me if I could go up there to West Point. They're holding it at West Point, and and would I host it? And uh, you know, I said, yeah, that sounds phenomenal. And I went up uh, for the opening ceremonies, and uh, it, it was just an incredibly inspiring uh, and and beautiful experience. And uh, the integrity of the athletes, uh, the tenacity of them, people that refuse to let themselves be defined by the worst day of their lives uh, and through adaptive sports have refound that sort of the spirit that got them involved in, in uh, the military and service in the first place. And so I, I said, you know, as I was driving home that night, man, th this should be on ESPN. Mm -hmm. And so we called you guys and, and uh, you came out for the rest of the games, filled, filmed a couple of things. And then this year, uh, are really getting behind it, and you know we appreciate that like crazy. Well, it's, it's our delight and our privilege. Air Force Master Sergeant Brian Williams, again, was in his second deployment, and we'll let you tell the story here briefly. Not so much of what happened to you there, but of your recovery and of what role sports has played in that for you. Fact. Well, I was on my second deployment to Afghanistan as a military working dog handler when. Uh, an ID went off while I was walking up a set of stairs and 
thankfully everything that could have went right that day did. And um, I was taken back and I started my recovery at Walter Reed at Bethesda, Maryland. And one of the things I really wanted to do, though, is they, they, put, they, they showcase a lot of things you can do to try to get you to do other the, to do other things and I love playing basketball standing up so when they were talking about wheelchair basketball they didn't have to really push too much and as I was doing wheelchair basketball in Bethesda Maryland the Warrior Games were being showcased I believe it was in uh, Colorado Springs at the time and that just gave me a, a goal a set, uh, to a set for myself to try to make it to the Warrior Games and uh, my first Warrior Games was in Quantico, uh, 2015, and I've enjoyed it. I've enjoyed the relationships I made with the uh, people on my team and from the other services, and it definitely has given me other other sports that I never thought about doing: archery, sitting volleyball. I didn't ever want to do that either, but I guess I'm okay at it. So, <laughs> so therefore, I'm allowed to participate and give an opportunity to do that. It gave me a goal, something else to think about other than what had happened back in April 2012. And and, and first and foremost, obviously, thank you for for your service and, and what you've done for us. And obviously, what went on in, in losing your your leg, but also the story of how a a twenty dollar watch may have uh, yeah. may, may have helped out in in other areas. Explain that. So I had a twenty dollar Casio watch I purchased prior to my deployment. So I could, and I kept, uh, it was a Arizona time, at the, at the, I believe. I just kept it local so when I went down range, I didn't have to do the math to figure out what time it was back home so I could call my then girlfriend at the time. Just call her to check up or say hello, good morning, good night. I, it's just, just one less thing I had to worry about. I just knew what time it was back home. Well, because of that watch, the doctor said took a, the brunt of the blast, which saved me from losing my my left hand altogether so if you don't have a 20 dollar casio watch you might want to go purchase it. <laughs> <laughs> that I is can... the commercial for casio yeah, boy, it's it is. I mean, wow. well, the, the best years of the well we're talking about things that happened that day i had my we have you have iphone yeah oh yeah, yeah. oh definitely you have otter box gotta get otter box what's that the otter box is the thing that covers the the iphone so it prevents it from getting hurt. Oh, okay. I had my phone in the otter box, my left cargo pocket, the day the blast happened. And when I got my stuff back after the blast, I had my dog tags and my phone and uh, uh, a necklace I was wearing. Well, we charged the phone up. The phone still works. Wow. That's another commercial for the otter box now, though. Hey, man. You know, <laughs> throw something else in. <laughs> and, then I had, and then I had a Porsche. I had a Porsche here. And that took a lot of the. Uh, John Stewart and Aaron Sports Master Sergeant Brian Williams are in our studio with the Straight Talk brought to you by Straight Talk Wireless, best phones, best networks, no contracts. John, obviously, you are in the midst of so much conversation at all times of various kinds. This feels like something that everyone can support, right? Regardless of what your beliefs are, whether they they agree or disagree with the things that this one says and that sure, one I says. So. This is someone everyone should be behind. No, it exists outside of it. And, uh, uh, you know, especially this year, we're doing it in Chicago. And the idea is, uh, you know, when it was back at West Point or, or Colorado Springs, it was generally the athlete, their family, maybe caregivers that uh, they had seen all the time. And it was a great feeling of family. But I think it would be really important for the public to be able to come out, support uh, these athletes, You'll see phenomenal uh, uh, events. You know, these guys are, are world-class athletes. And uh, uh, it's really, it, it's a great experience. So from Chicago, we really want to see if we can get the community involved. We're going to be doing stuff at Soldier Field, the United Center. He, you know, Brian might be out there at the United Center. Wheelchair basketball, that's going to be awesome. Absolutely. Let me take a short break on that thought. I want to make sure everyone is aware. The website is dodwarriorgames.com. You can like them on Facebook for real-time updates. The hashtag is Warrior Games. We'll take a very short break. We'll come back and we'll continue more of this in just a moment. On Mike and Mike, honored to continue talking about the upcoming Warrior Games in Chicago, June 30 through July 8. 
The great John Stewart is with us here, and Air Force Master Sergeant Brian Williams, who again will be playing wheelchair basketball, seated volleyball, and cycling in the games is here. And as the rest of the country joins us, Brian, you were making the, the point that you are still in. You are still in active service, and a lot of people don't expect to hear that when they see you. Yes, sir. Um, so, I mean, after the injury, uh, that was another goal of mine other than the adaptive sports, which was to stay on active duty. And someone told me, don't feel inclined like you have to do that. And I said, well, given the opportunity, I'm going to do that because there's other people that same summer that didn't get to make that choice. So I'm still doing it. I'm currently an instructor for the 343rd Training Squadron at Lackland Air Force Base, the gateway for the Air Force, um, training the newest, brightest security forces defenders coming through that tech school. And it's I enjoy my job. I really do. I love it. And, and you know, one of the things we, we, we talk about is the camaraderie amongst, you know, you know soldiers, but also you were a canine handler. So there, there's that camaraderie there. So and the dog you were with in Afghanistan is still with you? Yes, he's currently at my on my couch, probably at home with, <laughs> with my wife. And that was a I was fortunate enough to be able to adopt him as well. Uh, he was still very young and um, chief chief of staff, secretary of the Air Force. Chief Master on Air Force, they were all in line. They allowed that adoption to happen. So now he's at home with me. He's 10 years old, and the veterinarian can't believe he's 10. Like a puppy. That's, that's awesome. Although we're yeah, working on the name. It's Carly right now, which for a dude, <laughs> you know. That's a, right. it's not, at least it's Carly with a Y. It's not Carly with an I with a little right. heart right, right, above right. it. So it's, we're, right. we're working on the name. The heart above it would be that's, the key. That's, right. that's exactly right. And, John, you were making the point that this seems to be – that you, the observation you have made is how important getting back to being part of a team is and all oh, of that, yeah. and your experience talking well, to a lot of these in, guys. Inherent in their, uh, uh, just the composition and the makeup of these men and women is that idea of service and, and relevance and, like you said, uh, teammates. For, for instance, uh, Master Sergeant, also uh, with the Air Force, Israel Del Toro, who we were talking about earlier, um, DT had, he went through the medical board 100% disability, and he fought like crazy to get back and has re-enlisted uh, in the Air Force. He's training uh, uh, parachutists at the Blue Wings out, out in Colorado Springs. And just a phenomenal guy, phenomenal spirit. But, you know, the first 100% uh, disability case where he was re-enlisting in, mm. in the Air Force. How, I mean, it's, it's amazing. How important is that for you and for others, it's, that part of it? The re-enlisting part? Yeah. I, there was a point in time, sir, that I... I didn't think I was going to make it my first enlistment. So that's why I wanted to re continue to re-enlist and have that opportunity afforded to myself. And I'm, a, I'm, I'm happy. I'm happy doing my job. Um, I don't second guess doing any of that. Like the impact I feel like I have on the next generation of security forces guys and airmen in, in general, I'm going to keep doing it. I do like what I'm doing. Air Force Ma Master Sergeant Brian Williams, I, I don't know that I – I could count the number of ways in which you are an inspiration to people. And so we are privileged to have you here today. And we wish you nothing but the best with everything, including, again, the upcoming Warrior Games, which will be in Chicago June 30th through July 8th. I want to repeat all the places you can find information about this, dodwarriorgames.com. You can like them on Facebook. You can also use the hashtag Warrior Games on Twitter. And, John Stewart, your involvement in this, obviously, phenomenal. Very quickly, because we've never had a chance to have John Stewart on. Brian, I will right. let you make the final call. Huh. Four years now, yes. people have been telling me, John, you yes. and I, are, we come from similar places in the world. And we're, we Jews. Similar right. <laughs> say we're Jews. Say it, we're Jews. We're Jews. Say we're Jews. Right. We, look, we look like Jews. Right. I could have, I yes. could have used my middle name also, That's and right. I, I would be Michael Lee. We look it. like the before <laughs> and after <laughs> Rabbi <laughs> Institute. So That's, That's sure. the question. Is That's you, like. In your mind, yes. Brian, do you think John Stewart and I look alike? I'm going to go gladiator style. Thumbs yes, up. Yes, he says. Thumbs yes. up. Are you not entertained? Yeah. <laughs> People have been telling me for a very long time yeah, yeah, that, yeah. I, that I remind them. I don't know that it's just facially, which we do look a little bit alike. Right. And we're yeah. now just let me, posted let me old this, pictures that, of us. older yeah. one, I think you guys the look The older one, alike. we look alike. And then somehow... I got hit by the Ark of the Covenant from Raiders <laughs> and got destroyed. So the ravages of age. So I don't know what sort of 
I don't know if it's gefilte fish. I don't know what they're feeding you, but <laughs> he colors you, his hair. Yeah, yeah. I do not. It's, uh, it's not true. Uh, he says that, and it is not. I do. True. I say yeah. that all the time. I went Gandalf when, I, back then. I had a red. But I love head. that look. I want to go fully that look, and then I'm getting a robe, and a staff, and I'm going to go try and part to see. That's right. You, you know, can do that. Moses. That's you what can, I, that's you what can I want absolutely to do. do. That actually, our people are really the only ones who can. Well, yeah. See. But it's fine. <laughs> Listen. <laughs> I'm going to I'm tell you this story later. You'll come. You'll have a nosh. I'll tell you this story. <laughs> by the way, uh, I can tell that you have a lot of athletes on your programs because uh, I could be joined by another one of the my The seats time. are wide. Yeah. <laughs> this is nice. Somebody yes. sat on the set at one point and thought, no, Greeny did it first, thought these chairs were red. They are these, red. They are not to red. What? Brian, what color are these? Uh, these are definitely orange. They're orange. John, what color are these? They're, I mean, I, I hate to gang up on the, yeah. the, the poor fella, but they, they are armed. What, what One part of this do you see red? Can I ask a question real quick? Super quick. How long has that been eating at you? For a long time. <laughs> it just, it just, yeah. just driving home a lot yeah. of this. They're orange! They're orange! I don't know what's wrong with that guy! <laughs> the chairs are orange!